So, um, hello everyone. My name is um, Oluru Tsumi Adejimon from Nigeria, and I'm going to be talking about clinical assessment and examination in child and adolescent mental health. Um, I'll be following this presentation plan. I would like to talk about why assessment is important, what is the child's context, what are the goals of assessment, broad components of, assess of the assessment interview. So basically, um, assessment involves asking questions and observing a child or adolescent um, with the aim of providing um, a solution to the child's problems. And it's important for us to note that children are not little adults. What, me what that means is that um, a lot of the time they're not able to tell us their problems precisely the way an adult would. A lot of the time they do not seek help by themselves. So typically they're referred by someone else who's noticed those problems and wants to get um, more information about the problems and possible help. And then they also need to be assessed in the context of their environment, um, both the narrow environment, the family environment, and the larger society. So it's important to have guidelines for standard assessment. And it's important, this is helpful because um, it helps us not to, not to forget important areas and cover every area we need to. But apart from that, it's also important to note that children are different. Every child is different from the other, and it's important for us to be flexible. Um, it's important also to be aware of who is requesting the assessment. So the parents might have noticed certain things that they're concerned about and that's why they're coming. Or the teacher might have noticed the decline in academic performance is why they're sending the child. Or a pediatric doctor might have, might have noticed certain symptoms in the context of organic illness. Or a court might be um, requesting your expert um, advice um, because of certain juvenile um, oppositional behavior or conduct problems a child is having. So these a lot of the time tailor the kind of in, um, assessment you do and where you emphasize um, because you need to give a, rep, a report of some sort of some kind of feedback to the referring um, party. It's also important to examine a child taking into context information from different sources, the family, the school, the community. Of course, all of this should be looked at in the context of the larger cultural setting um, for you to make appropriate, accurate um, and conclusions. All right, so it's also important to be aware of the child's developmental age. There are certain behaviors and experiences that are normal at certain stages of development. For example, bedwetting in an infant, for example, is not so much of a problem, but if you have a four or five or six or seven year old who's still bedwetting, then you might start to consider the presence of um, um, mental health challenges. Um, it's also important to be able to consider that children are not always able to give a lot of information in a face-to-face -face interview the way you would be able to do with an adult. And so sometimes you want to observe the child playing with their friends or you want to um, watch a child scribble or write, you know, express themselves in some other form of play. And, and that can give us a lot of information. All right, so there are certain goals of assessment, and these are broad. I'll just cover this very briefly. Um, one of the most important goals of assessment is to form a good relationship for treatment. The whole essence of an assessment is to help a child, and you a lot of the time need the cooperation of the child and that of the family. So you want to develop a good relationship that would help this. You want to understand the expectations of the child and the person that is referring the child. You want to be able to identify what the most important complaints are and why um, help is being sought at the time it's being sought. Um, you need to be able to evaluate a child in his ease or peculiar context of functioning. So within the realms um, of the child's functioning and um, development, you need to be able to know how the child's problems impact on their immediate environment and how the environment impacts on the child. You also want to understand the child's developmental patterns since birth. Has this been a continuous problem or is it just evolving? Um, you also want to know about function in the family. You want to know about uh, you want to be able to identify factors in the child, in the family, or in the environment that may be causing these problems, be relating to, um, related to these problems, in some way contribute to worsening these problems or alleviating it in some way. And you want to be able to bring up together all the inform information you've received in a way that is helpful. Um, you also need to be able to target symptoms that are specifically um, target symptoms very specifically in a way that helps treatment. And you also need to be able to communicate your findings in a way that's understandable by the child and their parents. Mm -hmm. All right, so there are broad components of diagnostic assessment, and these include the parents and child interview, the mental status examination, a medical history and physical examination, and um, sometimes the use of rating scales and psychometric instruments. Now, it's helpful to note that in dealing with the parents and child, in doing an interview of parents and child, it's helpful to be able to see the child in the context of the family, the child interacting with the parents. It gives you an insight into what happens at home. But at the same time, it's helpful a lot of time to observe the child apart from the parents. And so it's helpful at some stage of the interview to be able to see the child on their own apart from the parents. Um, when you're dealing with adolescents, it's generally found to be helpful to see the adolescents before the parents because that helps to strengthen their confidence um, in you and to assure them that you're not biased against them. Um, 
All right, it's also helpful to note that parents are more likely to have noticed more externalizing symptoms. So things like restlessness, oppositional behavior, and impulsivity are more likely to have been noticed by parents and to be complained, um, to be the complaints of parents. And a lot of the time they tend to overlook the more subtle signs like internalizing symptoms like anxiety, feel feelings of anxiety and depression that a child might have. And sometimes even suicidal ideations might have been missed by the parents. Um, so there are five important areas to keep in mind. Well, in every stage of the clinical ex examination. And these are, first of all, symptoms. How frequently are the symptoms that are being complained? How frequently do they occur? How severe are they? You know, how long do they occur whenever they do occur? In what context? Do they happen in school and not at home? Um, in some other public place and not at home? Or do they happen at home and not elsewhere? You know, which symptoms came first? You know, and are they worsening? Are they improving? Are they just the same and you know, staying the same? What are the impacts? What's the impact of these symptoms on the child's functioning and on the functioning of the family? What are risk factors, things that could have led to the current problem as you're perceiving it? Are these things that may be genetic? Are there things in the child's social environment? Are there things that relate to the temperament of the child? You know, and are these things that are worsening the condition or you know, keeping it the same or tend to um, perpetuate the problem? Now, what are the strengths in the child and in their immediate family? You know, and are there any explanations? Um, or what are the explanations you're going to give you know, at the end of your um, assessment? So, um, there are certain goals to the parent interview. First of all, you want to obtain the parent's account of the referral. Why are they coming and what are they coming about? And what are the child's difficulties in their opinion? And what are the effects the child's difficulties have had on the family? You want to find out details of the past child's past and current functioning. So they've known the child since he was young. How has the child evolved up to late? You know, have there always been problems or are these recent occurrences? You want to obtain information on family's functioning in the context of their community and their larger cultural setting. All right. You also want to find out about family history of medical or physical psychiatric illnesses that might be um, in some way related or responsible, you know, for the problems the child is coming with. Um, okay, it's important when you're starting to interview with parents to let them start broad, meaning um, as much as possible, let the parents tell their own story. Um, try and avoid leading questions. Just ask open questions. And then as, you, as the interview progresses and you need to find out more um, specific chronological facts or more specific details, then you could ha ask more detailed questions or more direct um, closed questions. Um, it's also important to note that you want to emphasize on the strengths of the child and family and not just the you know, negative areas. All right, it's important to note um, that there are basic, there are several areas in developmental history you need to take note of. So when you're asking the parents questions about the child, you need to find out about details of the child's development, basic functions like bladder and bowel control, you know, um, psychomotor milestones, when did the child first sit without support, when did the child first stand without support, when did they start to walk, you know, when did they make their first words, you know, when did they, when were they um, when were they able to separate without much distress from the parents? You want to find out how the child has been able to use words. What's the degree of the child's vocabulary? Um, how is the child functioning in school compared to his peers? Um, how does the child interact with siblings, with non-family members? How does the child relate to strangers and people who are adults compared to children and young children compared to adults? Um, what's the child's temperament? How frequently does the child throw a tantrum? Um, how severe are these tantrums? What are the settings? You know, um, significant life events are very, very important. You want to know as a child suffered any form of abuse. Um, you know, emotional, sexual, um, or neglect of any form. All right, so interviewing the child, it's very important that you um, observe the child very closely and um, start the interview as much as is possible on, an, on a neutral level. So you're not talking right away about the child's problems or you talk about things that are interesting to the child, like their favorite pet, their favorite TV show, games that they like and their hobbies. And for younger children, sometimes it's, in, it's helpful to introduce play and then probably join in with a play and then ask a couple of simple questions as you go along. So the child gains confidence early in the interview. With adolescents, it's quite sensitive and you want to em emphasize the fact that you're on the adolescent side, you're not going to take their parents' side against them and you want to ask um, questions that relate to how they feel they're different from their peers or how similar they are to their peers and what are their plans for the future. All right. It's important also to, ask, um, to assure adolescents of confidentiality. Whatever they tell you is going to remain with you unless um, you have to tell, those, um, tell their parents about this. It's important to inquire about rule-breaking behavior. It's important to ask about sexual activity and identity and other forms of um, 
risk, um, high risk behavior um, like alcohol and substance use, you want to find out um, have they used substances, psychoactive substances or alcohol at some point in the past? Do they currently use? To what level do they use? To what level have they used? Do they use in company of friends? Do they use in company with other family members? To what extent are they influenced by other people in their environment to use the substances? It's very important also that you ask questions about suicidal ideation. Um, and behavior. Have they hurt themselves deliberately in the past? Um, was this with the intent of killing themselves or not? It's very important to get this information. All right, now a mental state examination essentially focuses on obtaining objective description of the child's appearance, symptoms, and behavior and functioning at the time of the examination. So there's a wide range of um, things one is looking out for. First of all, the physical appearance of the child. Is it as expected for the child's age? Is the child well-groomed? Are there unusual features that might subject to this abuse, like bruises and cuts? You know, um, you know, or are there any features that may suggest like a, gene um, a genetic defect? And how does the child relate to you, the examiner? How does the child relate to their siblings and to the parents and anyone they came with? How easy is it for the parents to separate from, um, for, the par for the child to separate from the parents and the parents actually separate from the child? Um, what's the child's mood? If you ask the child how they feel, what do they tell you? And how do you observe the child's mood? Is it similar to what they said they feel like? Um, does their ch mood change appropriately during the course of the interview? When you're talking about things the child finds amusing or is interested in, does the child light up? Or does the mood just remain flat? You know, throughout the course of the interview, and that's important. Um, does the child express anxieties? Are this appropriate for age? Is the child scared of the dark? For example, you might expect that in a, a preschool child between the age of two and five. Are the fears unusual? Are they, you know, preoccupied with these fears? You know, and um, um, you also want to find out about psychomotor behavior. Is the child very, very withdrawn? Um, very with very little activity. So is the child hyperactive, jumping around the place and very, very active? Or does the child have any uncontrollable physical movements? And how does the child think? What kind of thoughts and concepts does the child express? Are they unusual? Are they odd? And then does the child talk about hearing voices or seeing strange things that other people can't hear or see? Um, how, does, how much speech does the child use? Does the child talk a lot? Are the, are the words that the child uses appropriate for their age? Um, how fluent are they? How fast are they speaking? You want to find out all these things. If you require a child to draw, how appropriate are the drawings for the age? What exactly is the child expressing? Um, is the child expressing a common theme in various drawings? Is that significant? Um, how, uh, how much is the child able to pay attention to what you're saying? How, how much attention does the child give to anything? If it's placed, the child focused on that. Does the child's attention move from object to object or to, from event to event? How much does the child remember? And you sometimes need to corroborate, of course, you need to corroborate this with um, the, the caregiver or parent. How much does the child remember about things that happened recently, like yesterday or a few minutes before? How much does the child remember about things that happened you know, weeks or months in the past? You also want to find out, does the child know where they are? You know, how connected are they to their immediate environment? Do they know who their parents are? Do they know who you might be? Um, does the child understand the problems? Or what's their perception of the problems that make them come to see you? Um, is the child able to judge hypothetical situations? And what's the attitude towards re re um, receiving help? So if you want to help the child, and you want to have psychotherapy like sessions, is the child going to take part? Is the child going to be looking forward to it? What's the attitude to cooperating with treatment. You also want to assess risk, like I said earlier, and you want to check for um, presence of societal thoughts or behavior, self-harming behavior, any thoughts or plans of harming people or risk-taking behavior. It's very important. So going on to the medical history of physical examination, you want to find out uh, medical problems that may be causing the problems the child is coming to you with, or maybe worsening those problems, or may just be coexistent. And, and so you want to find doing brief medical history, and you also want to do a brief physical examination. And if either of this produces information that is helpful or that is significant, you might want to go on to a more detailed physical examination and possibly even investigations are referred to a specialist. Okay, so you're, import, you're interested in setting out items of history that if they pop up, you might be thinking about further investigation. Stuff, things like um, unusual presentation or age of presentation of symptoms. So you don't expect um, auditory hallucinations, for example, in a young child of age three or four or five or six or seven, and that might point you to a very serious problem going on. You want to refer the child. Um, if there is a history of seizures, if there is a significant history of head injury or infection of the central nervous system, if a child had normal developmental milestones up to a point and then there was a decline, you may want to send the child for more detailed examination. And certain item aspects of the medical history and pre, um, history are also important. Things like prenatal and perinatal development. Um, before, during the pregnancy period, were, any, were there any significant events? Um, did the child have a traumatic birth? Did the child cry at birth? Postnatal development, did the child have their vaccinations at the appropriate time? Was there any significant illness 
um, you know, that might have compromised the growing brain, you know. Um, serious infections, um, things like um, meningitis or encephalitis or cerebral malaria, very important to note. Now, a physical examination ideally should be conducted by a physician. And a lot of time you want to find, uh, you want to have a colleague who may not be a co-interviewer do the physical examination. And um, pediatricians are trained in doing physical examination in young children. And sometimes it's helpful to get them to do a physical examination as much as possible. Um, but however, um, there's basic anthropometric um, indices that you can do and basic neurodevelopmental screening items that you can carry out that may provide quite a bit of information and inform you to the need for sending for further evaluation or not. And some of these indices are things like the child's weight and height, the head circumference, blood pressure, skin, general skin inspection, the way the child walks and stands and other abnormal movements. These are things that you can observe very easily without even asking the child to undress. And uh, medical investigations are several, there are several forms of medical investigation and this will be indicated based on what you found. And um, there are a host of blood tests and urine tests um, that may be significant depending on your findings. And um, brain imaging, things like a magnetic, man, magnetic resonance imaging and electroencephalography, those are also confirmatory tests that could tell you a lot more clearly what you're dealing with. Genetic investigations, metabolic investigations, um, even a hearing examination if you suspect hearing impairment, all this could be very um, helpful and supportive to your assessment. Now, rating scales, I mentioned this because rating scales are um, a checklist essentially that you could give to the ch a child or an older child, an adolescent or a caregiver um, that helps them to indicate a wide variety of possible um, problems which may be present. And some of the advantages of this are they help you to conduct a comprehensive examination so you don't forget important things. And sometimes there may be clinical symptoms that the parents might not volunteer either because they forget that it's just not as important. And this could be a reminder to some of these things which actually may exist. And um, another advantage is that they may be completed outside of the time of interview. So you have you could actually spend time with the child and family and have them take away the rating skills to feel later. Some of the disadvantages are that when you um, when you ask the parents to feel or caregivers to feel, this could take up a lot of time. And they, a lot of time require literacy and they may be impersonal. So a lot of um, adolescents or families might not exactly like rating skills. Um, so essentially, when you got all of this information, you want to bring all this information in a way that uh, is concise and reflects the nature of the child's problem as well as the host of factors which are related to the child's problem. So things like coexisting factors and factors that contribute in some way you know, to the existence of the problem or even ameliorate the problems you want to know about. You want to note all these factors. You also want to have a list of possible um, entities that explain the symptoms the child is having. You also want to be clear about the domains of the child's life and the family life that are affected and you want to have an idea of your proposed interventions. Now it's important to communicate your findings in a very clear way to the child or to the parents or to the person you know requesting the um, assessment and to the child where um, appropriate and you want to use language that is clear. If there are technical terms you want to take your time to explain this and a lot of the time this information needs to be broken in different sessions so you don't rush to give too much information at one time because it might be difficult to take in for parents and as much as possible it's helpful to convey hope as much as possible. Emphasize also on the strengths of the child, emphasize on the strengths of the family, do everything you can to convey empathy. And also you might have a third party like a court or a teacher that you need to communicate your information to. Now, I just wanted to mention these um, few things to note about transcultural issues. To note that a child, to emphasize, we can't emphasize enough the fact that a child needs to be considered in their cultural context. So in certain parts of Northern Nigeria, for example, um, it's important to have adolescents interact with an interviewer of the same gender. And so female adolescents, for example, in those cultures are a lot more comfortable talking to a female interviewer. It's also important to note that in some cultures, parents like the fathers consider themselves more important than the child. And so it may be offensive for them to in insist that you want to see an adolescent first before the parents. And in these kind of situations, you need to explain to the parents, explain to the family, the reasons why it's helpful to the child to see them first, to gain their trust, and then to receive information and uh, permission from the parents to go ahead and do this. In a lot of situations, mothers are more familiar with details of the child's history um, and it's helpful to inf involve them as much as possible even when um, a lot of cultures um, would seem to downplay the influence of the mothers you need to insist sometimes that the mother provide information all right so I'm um, fine so, so in summary the clinical level um, assessment and um, um, is very important is a very crucial first step in um, assessing children child and adolescent mental health needs 
and um, it's very important, like we said, to be aware of the context, the age of the child, the person that is referring, the nature of the child's challenges within the family, within the school, within the larger culture. And if this is done properly and a thorough clinical assessment is conducted, this forms the basis for a comprehensive, um, well-designed plan, you know, that will bring as much as possible relief to the child's problems um, within each child's um, unique setting. Um, I'm sure this has been, hope this has been very helpful and um, thank you for listening.